Hi, my name is Lydia Jones, and I'm going to be presenting on Salmonella. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the Salmonella bacteria and what effects it has on the human body. So Salmonellosis is an infection that is caused by the Salmonella bacteria, which is in the family Enteriobacteriaceae. It's a modile gram-negative um, rod-shaped bacilli, and there's two major species of Salmonella. Salmonella bongori and Salmonella enterica. And in these two species, there's over 2,500 different uh, serotypes or serovars that have been identified so far. Um, there's a wide range of hosts for Salmonella, and there's frequent zoonotic transmission, so transmission from animals to humans. Um, and it's a very hardy bacteria. It can survive for several weeks in a dry environment and up to several months in a wet environment. Um, and then there's two main types of salmonella um, based on the effects that they have on the body. So there's typhoidal salmonella, um, which is caused by uh, salmonella typhi and salmonella paratyphi, and these cause um, typhoid and paratyphoid fever. And then there's non-typhoidal salmonella, which is what I'm going to be focusing on for this um, presentation, which is what we generally think of when we hear the word salmonella. So it's associated with gastrointestinal problems um, and stereotypical food poisoning symptoms. And um, that's covered by all other salmonella serotypes. Uh, so salmonella is, has animal, human, and um, non-living reservoirs. Um, it's transmitted by the fecal to oral route, and it can be transmitted either by contact transmission, so by direct contact with animals or other infected people, or vehicle transmission um, via contaminated food or water, which is what we generally think of um, when we're thinking of salmonella-associated food poisoning. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the signs and symptoms. I'm just going to address uh, non-typhoidal food poisoning associated salmonella um, because I believe someone else is covering typhoid fever in their presentation, so I'll leave that up to them. Um, but yeah, the typical signs and symptoms are headache, fever, most commonly diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramping, uh, sometimes nausea and vomiting. Um, and it has a fairly short incubation period, so you'll usually start experiencing these symptoms um, about 6 to 7. 72 hours, I think an average of 12 hours um, after um, exposure, so fairly soon. Um, it's not usually fatal, um, but it can it can be and it can have severe effects, especially in the young or elderly, um, especially because of severe dehydration that can sometimes occur as a result of fluid loss. All right, so now since this is for disease and society, I'm going to talk a little bit about the historical perspective and some of the effects that Salmonella has had on human society throughout history. So going way, way back uh, to the Neolithic or Stone Age period in uh, about 4,500 BC, uh, this is when we believe that uh, Salmonella probably made the zoonotic jump from animals to humans. So a 2020 study this year um, found that eight uh, Salmonella enterica genomes were in human skeletons of uh, foragers and early um, agriculturalists in Western Eurasia. And the strain that they found was a previously uncharacterized branch that was adapted to multiple mammalian species, so it wasn't showing species uh, specificity. Uh, and they believed that it was most likely an ancestor to a lot of the modern uh, strains of Salmonella that we see in humans today. And um, they link this transfer event to the rise of um, farming and livestock um, raising that was happening around this time period. People were really starting to raise animals for food and live in close contact with them in a way that they never had before previously uh, throughout human history. So jumping forward to the 16th century, um, the decline of the Aztec Empire um, has been linked to a series of epidemics called the Cocolitzli epidemics. Um, so obviously when the Spanish came over and were able to conquer the Aztecs, one of the things that played a big role in their ability to do this um, was the spread of pathogens. Uh, so they brought um, different diseases over with them that the indigenous people had not been exposed to before, and it really um, just absolutely wreaked havoc on the population there. Um, so estimates um, are kind of a little fuzzy for this time period because there's not uh, clear records keeping track of 
the exact amount of people that died, um, but they think it could have been anywhere from 5 to 15 million deaths. And if we're looking at the upper end of that, that would be um, about 80% of the Aztec population. So if, if that's true, that would make it one of the most deadly disease outbreaks of all of human history. Uh, so very significant loss of life. Um, and so in a recent st um, study, bioarchaeologists were able to uh, extract, once again, uh, Salmonella enterica genomes um, from the teeth of 29 people that were buried in what is believed to be a um, Kokolitsli associated mass grave. Um, and so this, this would imply that Salmonella at least might have uh, played some sort of role in those epidemics. Um, and based on the symptoms, they think that it might have been Salmonella causing um, some type of enteric fever that was what led to this uh, massive loss of life. So it wasn't until 1885 that Salmonella, um, that the causative agent of Salmonella was discovered. So it was uh, named Salmonella after Daniel E. Salmon, who was a very prominent um, and successful American veterinary surgeon who specifically um, focused on animal disease throughout the course of his career. Um, but even though he got the credit for it and it was named after him, he wasn't actually the one that discovered it. So from all records, it doesn't really seem that he played that big of a role in this specific study or discovery. It was actually his research assistant um, who was named Theobald Smith, who was the one um, that identified uh, the agent. So obviously, um, we talked a lot about this in class, and we watched the documentary on it, so I'm not going to go super into detail um, on the specifics. But uh, in 1984, um, the largest bioterror attack in U.S. history was carried out with Salmonella. Um, and it was an attempt by the Rajneeshi, um cult to uh, contaminate local salad bars and therefore make people sick so that they wouldn't be able to vote. Um, so that way they could skew the elections in their favor and gain political control of a nearby town. Um, one thing that was actually interesting um, that I found out while I was doing this project um, is I was talking to my dad and I found out that we actually have a family friend that used to be a Rajneeshi, which I didn't know. Um, that, so that was kind of an interesting personal connection. Uh, he wasn't one of the ones that was um, aware of the bioterrorism or had any idea about the salmonella plot or supported it in any way and he ended up actually leaving the group um, but I thought it was just really interesting to kind of hear a little bit about it from the perspective of someone that was there and a member of the organization. Uh, so then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the current state of salmonella in the U.S. and worldwide today. So in 2019, uh, there was 1,134 confirmed cases in the U.S., um, but it's suspected that there was probably a lot more um, that were unidentified because many people that contract salmonella don't necessarily go in for treatment or get tested. Um, and a lot of these outbreaks were tied to specific foods, as you can see here, um, a wide variety of different foods, um, some of which I, I was surprised I wouldn't have necessarily associated um, with foodborne illness, but that just goes to show that pretty much anything can be contaminated. Um, and then also several outbreaks were linked specifically to animals, uh, so pet turtles, pet hedgehogs, and one of the big ones um, was backyard poultry, so people uh, keeping chickens or ducks in their backyard. Um, one really concerning thing um, recently has been the rise of multi-drug resistant salmonella. Uh, so we've seen a serious increase in drug resistant strains and this has been attributed um, to a wide variety of things including um, the rise of antibiotic use and misuse. Um, and one of the really concerning um, new strains, which has been, uh, which is named ST313, uh, is a type of non-typhoidal salmonella. Um, it's called invasive non-typhoidal salmonella, and it's um, really frightening because it's non-typhoidal, but it behaves like typhoidal salmonella, and it causes bloodstream infections. Um, and it has about a 20 to 25 percent lethality, and they're seeing a lot of outbreaks of this in recent years in Africa, um, specifically in Sub-Saharan and Central Africa. And um, it has both human-to-human -human transmission, like non um, like typhoidal strains would, 
um, and zoonotic transmission like you would commonly see with non-typhoidal strains. Um, and since it's not actually typhoidal salmonella, it's not typhoid fever, um, it, there is no effective vaccine for it like there is with typhoid fever. Uh, so that's that's really an increasing area of concern and something that the CDC and the World Health Organization have been uh, monitoring and researching. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about treatment and prevention for salmonella. So the only way to actually get a positive diagnosis for salmonella is via a stool sample. Um, but if it is suspected that it's a severe case where the infection might have spread to the blood, um, then the physician will also order a blood test uh, once the stool sample comes back positive. So there's not a lot of specific treatment for salmonella. Um, honestly, it's mostly just home remedies and kind of just riding out the symptoms, essentially. Um, eating mild foods, making sure you stay hydrated, pain control. Um, if it gets really severe and requires um, hospitalization, then they'll usually do some type of rehydration therapy, um, fluids through an IV, um, and then antibiotics if it's a really severe case, especially if it's spread to the blood. So obviously, the first main thing um, when it comes to salmonella is you don't want to get it in the first place if you can avoid it. So um, the CDC has four major um, recommendations or guidelines um, for staying safe. Um, and so that's clean, separate, cook, and chill. So clean, you should wash your hands thoroughly. You should um, sanitize all food prep surfaces. So you should separate. So um, keep your raw meat and eggs separate from your raw vegetables, for example. Don't use the same utensils or knives on them without thoroughly cleaning them. Make sure you cook everything all the way through. Um, so you want to make sure that everything's completely cooked and you want to use a thermometer to confirm that it did, in fact, reach an adequate temperature to kill any bacteria. Um, and then you want to chill immediately. So you want to refrigerate your leftovers um, and you want to keep your fridge at 40 degrees or colder. Um, so no, no matter how good your great aunt's potato salad is, you probably don't want to eat it if it's been sitting out at the church picnic for three hours. It's probably not a good idea. Uh, and then lastly, I mentioned earlier um, that backyard poultry was a major reason for several of the outbreaks that we've seen recently. Um, so in, the, in 2019, there was um, a significant outbreak and out of the individuals in that outbreak, 63% of them reported that they had had direct contact um, with either chicks or ducklings. So the basic thing to keep in mind um, is that you want to be careful when handling animals and you want to make sure you're being sanitary. Um, as you can see here, here's a picture of me holding one of my ducklings um, when he was really small. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing gloves. Um, so I always wear gloves and I always wash my hands after I touch them. So you should always wash your hands. Um, and no matter how cute they are, they are also very disgusting. So you don't want to kiss them or snuggle them or put them anywhere um, near your face. And it's also a good idea to have um, special clothes, specifically special shoes that you wear, like when you're cleaning out the coop or something like that, for example, um, that you're not going to bring inside your house so you don't track in um, any bacteria with you. And then also another thing is you really want to closely monitor um, young children when they're playing with pets, um, specifically poultry, um, and making sure that they're not touching their face and that they're washing their hands afterwards. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you.